Welcome to Local Authors with Camille Nasser. I am Camille Nasser. I have a great old friend with me, Susan Eisenberg. Susan, so nice to be here the, with you. Um, you're a poet, a writer, so why don't we start off with a poem? Can okay. we do that? Start sure. right off with a poem. Go ahead. Lupus outwits me, declares martial law. Who would dream to awaken from fevered sleep, stun gun into paralysis by their own ruthless doppelganger? Power stations overtaken in a pre-dawn coup, from every organ of the body, a triumphant, unfamiliar flag. Who wouldn't be humbled by their doubles' brazen brilliance, or begin at once to plot in whispers the first frantic steps of resistance? Beautiful. Thanks. I mean, uh, beautiful and a different, beautiful writing. Uh, and you're talking about something that's re really difficult, uh, illness. Well, yeah, and so the Perpetual Care book is a book, yeah, that's exciting. This is your latest po book yeah, of poems. Yeah, yeah, so it's a book of poems and also has photographs in it um, of installations that I did. Um, so it's the first time I've done that, combining uh, uh -huh. poetry and uh, photographs, um, and it's all an exploration of um, yes. uh, chronic illness. Right, right. Let's start. Go back all the okay. way back. This you weren't. You're you're from Cleveland. I know. You know. I am. Um, and when did you come to the Boston area? When oh, I came in '71. Yeah. Uh, so I've been here. Oh, you've been here like long okay, time. Oh, yeah. a long time. Yeah. And and <laughs> tell us about your writing career. Uh, well, I um, I've always wanted to be a writer, and I can remember, um, and I don't know why. When I was in elementary school, we used to you know fill out these things of what you like to do and what you might be. And I remember um, like in third grade or something, it came back um, that I would either be a poet or a spy. <laughs> and then I realized later that that's really kind of the same thing. Um, a poet or a spy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so I think it's. Um, and then. Um, <laughs> um, Imagine if you had taken the other car, the other yeah, course. Maybe yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and then um, when I and was. And then you started writing poems. Uh, well, I always. always um, I always thought of writing. I was writing poems, so that's how. And I. Um, but I think I at that time I thought of it as you know rhymes and I had a very sort of certain way of thinking yeah. about it and then right. I had just the wonderful good fortune um, in the mid seventies after I came here to um, connect with Denise Levertov who became a mentor for decades for me. Yes. Um, yes. So she was at the time. So it was during the Vietnam War and the anti-war movement. We met and um, people connected us and at that time she was teaching at Tufts. Um, and she would be, she would take in an older person with life experience to kind of round out the class. I think I was 24, you know, so oh, yeah, yeah. elderly person That's, who yeah. came in. Yeah, I, I, did, yeah. I, I was yeah. part of the, the classes like that too, yeah. So, um, and that just changed my life, I think. So, um, she uh, just introduced me to, that's how I learned like the craft of poetry and the patience of poetry and in a way the idea of organic form and I think that's that idea has shaped the work I do and everything. Yeah, but um, um, okay, uh, I'm very familiar with your work. So uh, because of, we've known each other for so many years, uh, uh, your a lot of your work is was not poetry, was uh, not fi even fiction. It's uh, a lot of your poetry, a lot of your work is uh, nonfiction, and you did a study on uh, women in the trades, right? What, yeah. Was that? Was that before poetry or before you no. published poetry or? No, so um. I, um, yeah, so I'd say I always did poetry and then I, um, the book you mean is, uh, um, so I was working as a union electrician and the book is We'll Call You If We Need You. Yeah, you, you, went in, you went into a program of electricians. You yeah. Went, uh -huh. so I had, that was under Jimmy Carter, right? Well, so Jimmy Carter opened a construction jobs to women, set affirmative action guidelines for jobs and apprenticeships that open things to women. Right. And before that, I had called the union to find out about how to get into an electrical apprenticeship, and I was told the unions don't want you, the contracts don't, don't want you, we'll call you if we need you, and this is where the title came from, and then in April
April of 78 when these guidelines were issued. I got a phone call, can you come in Monday for an interview? <laughs> yes. So I very much, you know, connected that. So um, the We'll Call You book, um, I did interviews with 30 women around the country who were, um, came in at the beginning of affirmative action um, in five different trades. So, and I, I kind of blended their, or um, looked at their stories both individually and then what was the commonality of them. So to kind of yes. what was a common story that was larger than the individual yeah, story. Yeah, and, and some of the stories are not happy stories. Um, there were um, threats to the women. I don't, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm Yeah, yeah. Your no, fire I, so I would just say what's I why, why I'm laughing is yeah. that it's, it's um, I would say, uh, in some ways, uh, maybe like Vietnam vets who kind of retrace the same material. Like there's so there's some way I've been retracing the same material in that work for almost forty years, yeah. and I I just look at a deeper layer or a more honest layer. So yeah. the first poetry book I did that Denise did, Levertov did a, uh -huh. a forward for that was came out in eighty four. That was a work poems. Uh, all of those were positive and had a positive <laughs> ending. Yeah. And. Um, uh, you know, I did a reading in California, and a woman who had left the firefighters came up to me and said, you know, uh, if it was as wonderful as you make it sound, I would still have been in, you know, and then that really yeah. pushed me to do a poem, Pioneering, that was really about um, yeah. some of the harsher things, and I would say it's um, uh, how I think of it, and I, maybe a lot of things are like this, that you you actually do see everything and hear everything, but you choose to, you do that, you know, kind of agreed upon blinders that you only talk about what's here but you do process the other things so yeah. i would say it's just been about widening what i can yeah well talk give about. us give us a couple of uh, an idea of what uh, some of these women who went into the construction trades what they went through well so some people did have really successful careers right. so and um and i would say everybody had some I, I always like to say that, because um, somebody said, like, well, you should tell the success stories. And so I always say, well, we were all success, everybody was a success story at the start. So, um, but people have, um, and then I'm now working on a mixed media installation. That's a whole other um, yeah. thing. But, and that looks at issues of women who were set up to have accidents that, um, from which they died, or um, people who were sexually assaulted. Um, people who were named, you know, so it's all, I think like it's a civil rights history and all civil rights history um, kind of has that. In the We'll Call You book, um, there's a chapter that's about um, uh, violence, really, like the role yeah. that violence plays you, you, if you're keeping people from voting or if you're keeping yeah. people from uh, working at a certain job, it, at a certain point, it's sort of a natural instinct that people have to yes. do those things, so it does at a certain point require violence um, right. to enforce. So um, it's just trying to be open about that so that would change. You know. Yeah. Okay, we're talking with uh, uh, Susan Eisenberg. And um, read us another. Uh, this is uh, from the Perpetual Care book, yes. which came out in uh, 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, read yep. us another poem. So I'll read the. Um, yeah. okay. read the Okay. Yeah, we're talking about this. Yeah. Okay. Go yeah, ahead. we were talking about this before. Yes. So, um, yeah. So I think what what, I, what struck me when I um, I had lupus and then at the same time I had thyroid cancer and what struck me was that um, when you're here you are dealing with all these you know medical issues and and sort of at a weak point in that way are vulnerable then is also when you get this onslaught of of um, the health system. Yeah. So medical bills. White envelopes pile up in drifts upon the desk, unopened. She knows what's required, a pleasing manner and persistence to clear a path through their tangle of errors and settle on a sum or face a siege of dinnertime calls. Each day a relentless advance. More envelopes arrive. Through their clear windows, her imprinted name peeks out. A reminder of more than the money owed how vulnerable, how captive she's become, waiting for results, answers, a plan that will restore her own self. Yeah, I love the imagery of that. You know, I, you could you could uh, see it. You could see the envelopes and working at your desk and and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, now, um, you. Um, 
have a, a new job now, a new position at the University of Michigan, I, and, it, and it, was, it blew my mind what the position is called. Go ahead. Yeah, so I am still at, at, uh, I'm at Brandeis University at the uh, Residence Scholar at the Women's Studies Research Center nice. there, but I am also this year, I have a dual appointment, I'm at um, the Center for Education of Women at the University of Michigan as a Twink Fry Visiting Social Activist. That's, uh, that was the greatest, the greatest <laughs> title I guess, uh, of visiting nice, social, yeah. a social activist. Yes. Has there been any other such appointment? Well, uh, there, there is that. They've been doing it for, I think, 20 years. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they have is one there, person each year uh -huh. and you work on a project. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's a, just a wonderful... Um, so you're a scholar in residence at Brandeis, yeah. and and then you're going to be there for how, for so just yeah. so the appointment in Michigan is is for this this calendar academic year. So I was out there last fall. So do you consider yourself an activist? Uh, well, you, you, you know, go down the street and somebody says, "Who are well, you?" I say, "Oh, I'm an activist." And you well, say, oh. well, they said to them when they like when they told me uh, in Michigan like that they had. Selected me. I <laughs> said I really thank them because I thought it. I said all of my activism has failed really. So oh, uh, or been not you know not, yeah. Maybe, yeah. not that it's not had any effectiveness at all, but that isn't you know whatever one might have yeah. hoped. It, uh, so imagine I, if I we thought that was right. very generous of them yeah. <laughs> to pick somebody who. Um, you know, it wasn't like you had a rousing success. Uh -huh. so, so your but, your poetry took a, a turn when you had um, uh, when you had lupus, right? And when you when you had you went into the medical system, right? You started writing things, and I saw an installation. I don't remember what year in Lesley University where you have uh -huh. one, uh, a lot of your photographs, yeah. beautiful photographs Thank you. that yeah. you took um, of pill bottle, uh, rolls of pill bottles. Do you have them? Yeah. Yeah. It's right in the front of the yeah. cover is the roll yeah. of the pill yeah, bottles I think here. Can see them here. Yeah, uh, I can see yeah. them in the front there. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I wouldn't say that the, uh, in some ways I think the work, the poetry work has just in some ways been the same or always just kept growing in a certain way. but. Um, I think what was different uh, when I wanted to, to have the impulse to write about illness was that I, I just didn't really, couldn't really find the language for that. And um, then I ended up realizing that I had not thrown, I just was accumulating all these pill bottles. I hadn't thrown them out. I didn't know why. And I thought I would create a some 3D piece. Um, but then I was, um, I live in JP, but and I was at the, um, uh, uh, Forest Hill Cemetery, and I just had this impulse to bring my pill bottles to the cemetery and have them. What's in this picture was the first photograph I did. I said, yeah. I asked permission um, to set up the, uh, set them up, you know, kind of walking down the center of the road yeah. until they turned. Um, so these are all my pill bottles. So then I just, um, um, and each time I would go there to do a shoot, um, I would just know what I wanted to do for the next one. So it was the first time for me that photography felt like not just documenting something, but in a way very much that grew the same way as a poem does. You just have an impulse to do something, you don't quite know why, or a question that's, you yeah. know, you're just finding your way with it. And, so, and almost like the pill bottles knew where they wanted to go next. That's kind of how I felt it. Uh, um, the photography augments the poetry. Well, uh, more they're just visual poems is maybe yeah. how I think of it. But yeah, uh -huh. there was a a, a, a um, show at, of the photographs. There were tw a series of 20 photographs um, and at, that was up at, at the Moran Gallery at Lesley University and actually Cambridge Cable Access TV did a short video yes. about that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You, um, before we get, uh, yeah. I want to jump back again. I, I, saw, I didn't talk about your the installation of, um, of, of your... Uh, 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 don't we'll call you uh, yeah, we'll, we'll call, on equal terms. On equal terms, yeah. yeah. And you had this wonderful woman named Stella. Stella. Yeah. yeah, she was a, a Stella yeah. uh, artist. And um, you've taken that many places. Yeah, yeah. so that was um, at so it launched first at the Knizant Gallery at Brandeis, and then it was in downtown Boston at, at the uh, Adams Gallery at, at Suffolk. At Suffolk University. And it went yeah. to the uh, main gallery of the Smithsonian affiliated Michigan State University Museum out uh -huh. in East Lansing and then it was in um, the Lower East Side, um, which was a lot of fun as well, um, in New York at the Clemente Soto Velez Center. And then individual pieces have gone different places, or sets of pieces. I'll be part of a show this summer in um, San Luis Obispo, California at Cuesta College. 
um, there's a show, Rivet, that um, a woman is um, curated with uh, yeah. work of different women in the trades, and so, I'm going to go out there for an artist. Yeah, do you see uh, poetry as necessarily being social activism? No, I don't think no. anything is. I don't think anything is necessarily social activism, and I think sometimes things that people think of as social activism might not really be yeah. a, a social, you know, it might be, I, I guess I think you, it is something that one has to, uh, has to have be effective. So yeah, well, you could do so I mean, do you like the sound of words, do, uh, the metaphors, what, what's the... I always like the sound of words, so that's even when I was little, like I would, you know, like that sort of words that would rhyme or words that would, you could rearrange the letters, mm -hmm. so like language has always really interested me. Me. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, uh, so, um, and the playfulness of language. So, what about yeah. what about rhymes? Rhymes, I don't rhyme. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. did when I was younger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I really kind of came of age in the, um, and I didn't realize. I have a, actually an essay about the mentorship with Denise that's coming out in a book from South Carolina. That's of different people who worked with her at different points in her career, um, and that. To yeah. work on that essay, I had to go back and understand, you know, that relationship. Um, and I realized then that it was really, she was really kind of writing out the poetics of open yeah. form poetry then. And I had no idea of that at the time. I just, to me, that was sort of the canon. I didn't know it was new. Um, so, I, you know, then I see I had uh, uh, this essay on the function of the line, which is sort of a classic essay, but it was in yeah. a kind of a um, sort of a typed out form with... Mm -hmm. corrections and stuff so um, that was so this is local authors with Camille Nasser and I have uh, Susan Eisenberg with me and uh, uh, we're talking about poetry and and uh, uh, what poetry is mm -hmm. um, can you define it well um, I don't know if I can find poetry but uh, well, so I want to say something about the open form um, an yes. organic form right. so so what I what what one thing that I learned from Denise, or, or an approach I would say, was the idea of organic form, that the form, um, so rather than a set form, you have an organic form that fits the content of what you're expressing. So that, you know, that sort of form and content as the same, in, inseparable. And I think as someone who's done like different things of, you know, nonfiction and installation and photography and poetry, I think you know, there's some, it's sort of that same question of organic yeah. form of yeah. what um, what about this material wants to be uh, non-fiction or what about, you know, this yeah. goes in this way of needs mm. to be things arranged in a room that you can walk through. Um, uh, or I used to do theater as well and write plays. So it is something... Oh, you're um, all in the, completely <laughs> in the arts. <laughs> okay, come on, it's yeah. lap time for another poem. Okay. Come on. Um, Susan Eisenberg, we're talking about poetry and her poetry. This is from Perpetual Care, and um, the poems are pretty self-evident. All right. So, I'll, um, so there's a section in here. Uh, there's in four sections. One of them is a is family history, and it's kind of about. Um, I felt like not, it, to me like family history from the patient perspective. It's yeah. just a medical history, but it's what do you? What's the experience that you bring to illness? So, um, for me, coming to like lupus had a lot to do with being first a mother of some of a son who had asthma, and that was sort of my first introduction to chronic illness. So I'll read this poem, Umbilical, that's in two parts. Okay. Umbilical. Early asthma episode. A smiling med student with a clipboard kneels beside our chairs at urgent care. Calm as any day, she asked me to rate the health of my son, a wild stallion colt of a boy, her earnest pen poised to circle, excellent, good, fair, poor. She's been assigned to fill in blanks while we sit captive in this narrow room waiting for a rescue ladder to lift us back to the known world. My son is seven, but today, his oxygen not sufficient to buoy his body upright, he let me carry him from the car like a snow-suited toddler. I don't remember what I said, only how my son's full moon face hung on my response. Two, ten years pass. My son sounds the first alarm. You've lost your strength. 
Only after months and more insistent signs do his words assemble in my brain. He keeps watch, points out each turn, reminds me of the normal that was his mom, leads me by the hand through these cliff walks he's scouted. Are you okay? Are you okay? Mm. Sobering. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's when, when, do you get, when do you get it, uh, the inspiration to write? Do you just do you sit down and say, "I'm going to write a poem," or does it come no. to you while you're uh, walking the street? Or, uh, um, when you uh, see someone, talk to someone. How does it come um, to you? It's just something that I uh, no, I've never been good at. I mean, I always really admire that people are you know sit down at the table <laughs> yes. from this time to this time, or have their hat on this way or that way. Or uh -huh. um, but uh -huh. no, I've never really. Except for when I've had a writing residency, or I've, that's been yeah. more helpful that way. But otherwise, it's just sometimes I just am overcome, and I need to do that. How, so how many pieces of paper do you for, do you go <laughs> so through? Lots of scraps of to, paper files to, in different yeah, files. Yes, yes, people will you tell do. you that. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah and yeah. you and you like pick and and. Well, or like try to put them together. Yeah. Actually, once my when my she was little, my daughter did a picture drawing of me that was like me with curly hair and then these papers like like around so, so, like, so like, like a like, halo oh, oh yeah these papers. And, oh, yeah that was that's great yeah <laughs> Do you, yeah, on a little how, sticky how about, how about at it's night? Do you get like in your dream or something? You have a dream. Yeah, you know, there you is get... like a, a, a uh, Levertov poem about writing in the dark, of having always having something there to write with that's you know won't go, you know, that will be working. So uh -huh. I did it, but I have also um, recently started on a wall in this room that I do more of the visual arts things. Uh, a um, kind of the beginning of an installation of notes that I find that I've written very urgently to myself that I have no clue what they I can't read them yeah. or oh, like I can read they're, them, they're I can read them but I have no idea yeah. what they refer to yeah mm -hmm. so I thought like oh this is, this is sort of the beginning of a of an installation project maybe of just these urgent notes to myself have, have you been to poetry slams no I don't really like poetry no. slams no, because um, I'm just a slow person, so I, I like to um, like listen to something, you know, whether it's whatever it is, like a play, a speaker, a poem, like, so to listen and absorb it. So the idea of, you know, uh, yeah. voting on something right away or cheer, boo, uh, is just not how I hear poetry or really hear anything. So it's just not, it's not really my, um, yeah. although I think it's what, like that sort of slam poetry has helped. Um, push poets to be better readers, mm -hmm. so I think that's a really wonderful thing, but it, it's just not a format that's right, right. comfortable. So, um, as, a, as an Arab American, I'm, I'm very pleased that you've written poems about uh, Palestine and, uh -huh. and, and Arabs. Did, have, have you been to the Middle East? Have you been to? I have. Yeah. Well, once, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and when was that? Uh, well, I almost went in the summer of 2014, uh, but then uh, that was uh, <laughs> not turned out. It was not a time. Yeah, I, I remember yeah. that. I remember yeah. that. And then, so, and then you went. So then I went the, the year the next, after that. The yeah. Year after so I went the year after that. Although and, when I happened to be there, when there was the killing of the family in Duma, um, so I mean, I think it's never an easy time to go to no, Israel, Palestine. Never, yeah. And, and, yeah. And why were you sensitive to to the Palestinians? Um, well, I think, in some ways, I think all of these issues are very similar. Of there's a certain narrative that repeats, or a certain set of characters that repeat. Yeah. Or, uh -huh. uh, I think any injustice sort of has a very similar trajectory, and um, yeah, so. Um, kind of friends and I don't know. I guess. Oh, okay, one more poem. Okay. One more poem. We've got. We've only got oh, okay. about uh, uh, three, two or three minutes oh, uh, read left. The, okay. I'll read the poem that's at the end, and that it's um, the the book is also um, just since we're in Cambridge is dedicated to Rita Arditi, who was um, one of the founders of the Cambridge Community Cancer Project okay. and a very dear friend who um, died of 
metastatic cancer, breast cancer after 30 years. Okay. Um, and this poem ends with her words, and it starts with the story of uh, another woman electrician who had brain cancer. Um, so it's that um, okay. kind of both of them. Hope. I offer my friend the green cocktail napkin kept for weeks in my purse. Across one corner, the name of a doctor at work 3,000 miles away on a cure for her brain cancer, jotted with borrowed pen by someone met at a party. She accepts the folded square, but bluntly discourages more such notes. There isn't anything. I'm chasing back to another friend's words in her 30th year of metastasis midair, once again, between one chemo failing and the next concoction. No trapeze bar to grab. We're always looking for hope. Hope that's not stupid. Hope that's not stupid. Well, that's <laughs> that's the line. Everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the uh, beautiful line. Yeah. <laughs> And, and um, it's a great thing that you did for a lot of people. You, for a lot of people who have um, illness, you brought, you brought hope, you brought uh, or uh, joy or something. You brought something uh, that's more deep, right? Well, I, I was just. I guess maybe I more think of it as like uh, I write um, or do so to be a life raft. Like a creative yeah. poem, maybe is a life raft for myself. Um, and then sometimes that might work that way for somebody else of articulate a feeling they have, um, but they have might not be you know, have the imagery to say that, but it uh, might resonate. So that matters a lot to me that if it's about a community of people that it has a resonance. All right, Susan Eisenberg, <laughs> really a pleasure to be with you. Good to be with you. <laughs> Local author.